Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending um, our uh, 2023 uh, live series for the North American AO um, Hand Education Committee. Um, we, uh, we decided to try a, a fireside chat series this year, uh, highlighting basically uh, one topic in, in a series of case-related uh, presentations uh, that we call three cases. Um, and the topic of today's uh, uh, of today's um, um, uh, webinar is uh, PIP fracture dislocations, which are quite common and often fraught with uh, nuance and challenge. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Mark Rizzo. I'm the, uh, the chair of the uh, NA, AONA Hand Education Committee and also moderating this session. We have a wonderful faculty. Uh, we, for, each, uh, for each series, we have a SAGE, and this year, uh, this uh, webinar will have uh, Dr. John Capo, who's professor of, uh, of orthopedics and uh, vice chair of orthopedics at uh, uh, Rutgers, our, our, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health in Jersey City, Amy Speckard, who is assistant professor at Ohio State University, and uh, Gary Solomon, who I've known quite a long time as a uh, our hand therapist as and as director of uh, therapy at Chicago Metro Hand Therapy in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Thank you all for coming and uh, being part of this. Uh, we're blessed to have such a wonderful faculty. These are our disclosures, <clears throat> and they've been vetted, and um, uh, there will be no uh, no conflicts related to our discussion. By way of introduction, this is our. Uh, I'll introduce the, the uh, with a few introductory slides and also the first case. Um, Dr. Capo will talk about uh, how he does it, uh, speaking to uh, treatment and uh, pearls and pitfalls related to treatment. Um, I've uh, switched things up a little bit and we'll have uh, uh, Gary to discuss um, uh, therapy nuances and these often uh, so therapy dependent injuries and, and Amy will round out with a, a case uh, looking at complications and how to navigate a little bit of discussion related to that. As we round out, we'll have a case discussion with the pan uh, I mean, uh, we'll review uh, with a dialogue with uh, each of us as well as address any questions that come up from attendees. Uh, you are uh, entitled to CME credit for the Entire year, there'll be a maximum of 11.25 AMA uh, Category 1 credits. Uh, you will receive these credits after the entire series, which will be at the end of the year. And, uh, and the credits will be received upon completion of a link and um, uh, to claim your credit and access your certificate after you complete a questionnaire. Content, uh, there's, there's a content validation st statement. Um, we are a nonprofit. Um, AO North America, especially a society direct, uh, dedicated to improving care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. We do not endorse nor promote any particular product or commercial entity. And uh, any equipment used in any of our courses is for demonstration and teaching purposes with the intent to hands education and the learning experience for attendees. By way of Zoom etiquette, uh, all microphones have been muted uh, and video cameras turned off. I send in all questions through the Q&A box. Uh, myself or one of the other faculty will review and sort questions as they appear and present them to the faculty for uh, speakers and further dialogue. Uh, we can sometimes answer questions also through the Q&A box uh, without uh, formal dialogue as well. Use the chat box only. Uh, uh, the chat box is used only for faculty and staff. Uh, there are learner objectives which are highlighted here. I won't, I won't uh, uh, outline them uh, verbatim which is just more or less for your review. And uh, again, this is the first of a series of nine sessions that we have, and you can see the next one will be February 16th with uh, a topic uh, related to SCAFO and non-union, of which uh, Dr. Jim Higgins is the sage. And, and you can see further down uh, flaps, uh, tendon ruptures, sports injuries, metacarpal fractures, brachial plexus and peripheral nerve, uh, distal radius malunion and DRUJ arthritis. We're really excited about this series and hopeful that it will um, translate to um, a good uh, a good dialogue, good learning experiences for the attendees. Um, we do also have live face-to-face uh, uh, -face courses. Uh, uh, the next course is uh, uh, our hand and wrist uh, fracture management course, a one-day course in Ann Arbor, Michigan, chaired by uh, Dr. Jeff Lawton. Uh, we also have our advanced upper extremity course chaired by Dr. Peter Ree and Dr. Kevin Malone on June 8th through 10th. 
Um, the AO, um, another one day hand course in Dallas, Texas this year with Dr. Kim Mazera chairing on September 16th. And our final face to face uh, course for 2023 is an advanced risk summit, which is chaired by myself and Dr. Kim Mazera on November 2nd through 4th. Um, the, um, there are also uh, webinars. Uh, we have one next week with uh, Dr. Uh, Emil uh, Dionysian. Uh, discussing metacarpal fractures and complications. He's moderating that session. And on May 3rd, we also have uh, soft tissue flaps with Dr. Jay Bridgman moderating. And August 2nd, Dr. Neil Ba will man, uh, moderate the uh, Mangled Hand webinar. And finally, Dr. Jeff Lawton on November 1st will moderate a terrible triad uh, webinar. Hopefully you'll find our educational offerings uh, valuable and uh, we welcome any feedback you all have as attendees. Uh, this will be recorded and available on YouTube uh, at our um, at our um, uh, site AOAN North America. So, without further ado, I'll get started. Um, and this is uh, by way of case presentation: an 18-year-old female who uh, sustained a volleyball injury of her left middle finger, um, and she was seen like many of these cases in the emergency room. And uh, at the at that time, her exam was uh, 20 to 90 degrees, tender at the PIP, skin and neurovascular intact. And in terms of treatment, um, you know, um, one thing we've learned, and we as hand surgeons have a good sense of, is uh, this is a very important decision point in how you manage this. And uh, how we treat this conservatively and reduce it can prevent potentially the need for further intervention or even surgery. Um, and in this case, it's important to, um, to understand where the, where the vulnerability is uh, in how you treat this. And if you treat this in extension, uh, you do invite the potential problem. Um, and it's not unusual in, in many ERs to uh, see an injury like this and have the patient just put in uh, a splint that maintains them in full extension. And in this case, this is what happened. Uh, she was treated in extension, and you can see it two weeks post extension splinting um, what her x ray looks like. So here we are now at two weeks post uh, injury. And um, uh, at this point, the question would be can we reduce it? And can we maintain that reduction? Obviously, at two weeks, it's a little bit more tricky and a little bit more challenging um, because uh, the uh, dynamics of the soft tissues are starting to stretch out and uh, the reducibility becomes more and more um, difficult to maintain. It's important to stress, too, that this is also uh, uh, if... Uh, you have a central slip injury like this photo and x-ray shown that actually splinting and extension is the correct answer. <laughs> so in many ways, um, uh, it's important to maybe have a, a dialogue educating your primary care providers who refer patients to you as well as the ED that this is something that should be treated with an extension block splint holding them in flexion, much like uh, described by McElfresh and Dobbins years ago, whereas this injury needs to be treated in extension. And if you put them in an extension block splint, this is the improper way to manage these. And um, John, Amy, any thoughts on those concepts and how you uh, relate that to residents and fellows and, and, uh, and uh, your referring providers? Uh, Mar Margaret, I think it's hard to, for uh, ER docs and primary care docs to splint correctly. So I would just say if it's broken, you know, send it to us right away. But for the residents, you know, they need to know that if the dorsal cortex is intact, that you flex them. And if it's, you know, if it's a, a dorsal fracture or it's a, a peline, you, you treat them in extension, uh, and then they still probably need an operation. But for referring docs, I, the key is, you know, send it to us fast. Gotcha. Yeah, I would echo that. I think your orthopedic residents, um, you can train and they can recognize these injuries and get them to you quickly. But um, in general, that's not the case across the country, right? There, there's not always an orthopedic resident evaluating every finger injury. And so I think what we just try to stress is if they can't move the finger well, whether that be a tendinous injury or a fracture, get them to us as soon as possible. And 
we can delay their consult if it's not urgent, but we can't undo a delayed referral. Yeah, good point. Nice way to phrase it. And um, I get it. You know, the one minute they're seeing chest pain and next minute they're seeing a PIP fracture. So I'm not, it's not meant to cr criticize. It's just meant to focus on the best, uh, the best uh, way to manage these injuries and understanding and educating. And it's important to have a wonderful relationship and dialogue with your local emergency room. By the time she actually got to my clinic, it was four weeks post injury. And this is her ex right now. And, um, so she's now tender at the PIP. She's progressively losing motion. Uh, she remains neurovascular intact and her skin's intact. And she's a little bit more swollen than she was initially, which is understandable. And, and what I did in this case, and I welcome your all thoughts, is I, I numbed her up and I did a, uh, a reduction maneuver, um, which is a little bit like the McElfresh Dobbins sort of type splinting. And just to see what she's stable um, where she, her stability was, because uh, now here, we, again, we are four weeks post-op, and she was stable at uh, probably 70 degrees, more than 60 degrees. And um, let me ask, uh, you know, what do you all think? Is this, I think I know the answer. Uh, this is probably not the appropriate way to manage this. How about, Gary, maybe you can tell me, what, what do you think, uh, what's an acceptable amount of stability from a rehab perspective that you can say, if I send a patient to you and I said, okay, they're stable to 30 degrees of extension. Once they get to 20, they start to slide back into, um, into uh, subluxation. Is that something you'd feel comfortable uh, with extension block splinting? Around 30, even up to 40, I've had success with um, more than that. And 40 would be probably the end. Once you start getting to 40, 45, you, you're pretty much the person would have to understand that they would have a flexion contracture. It, it would be almost certainty that that would be the end result. But if they're trying to avoid surgery, then that's that could be reasonable. You know, we could probably get it back to about 25 to 30. But yeah, typically between 30 and 40 is sort of the limit is how far you want to go. Perfect. Uh, I, I am inclined to agree. That's been my experience as well. And uh, um, so in this case, it, it, it became fairly clear to me that more would be necessary. And in an effort to, to sort of uh, move things along, I opted to move forward with a, uh, an attempt at uh, extension block um, um, dynamic, I mean, a dynamic ex, uh, external fixer, like a force couple device, which I'll illustrate here in a second. Um, yeah, one thing I've learned uh, as Pearl is it's important to have a plan B when you're planning these surgeries. And, and we can talk a little bit about some of the nuances of that as we go forward, because uh, uh, John will have a nice talk on, on how he does it. But I'm going to nest the case within a case just to highlight the, uh, the the methodology of these, if you're not familiar, they're actually sort of pretty cool cases to do. Um, they're a little nuanced. And, and um, one of the important points here is that we're trying to reduce this by using the, uh, the, the rubber bands and pins to help reduce the joint back into a volar position where it's actually more concentric. And the key to the success here is having an intact dorsal cortex. If you don't have an intact dorsal cortex, you can probably over distract, you're vulnerable to over distraction and you're vulnerable to uh, not maintaining the reduction well. So that's the principle of the force couple that AG uh, cleverly described. Um, and this is a step-by-step -step process of how they're done. It's uh, no formal incisions. The key is to get this first pin right concentric. If you do this right, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, and the other thing, if you're gonna err on where to position this one, uh, err a little bit on the uh, dorsal side so you can facilitate better reduction, but you want this also to likely be center center. And ultimately a third pin, which is a threaded 6-2 pin that I put in here, just aim to sort of act as a post to help maintain the reduction. And this is sort of what it looks like when, when all is said and done. And this is the patient okay, go ahead. I'm trying to move it weeks. Let's start. We actually start a motion of the These patients uh, do need to be followed fairly closely. And um, as you can go on to see at six weeks post op, uh, he is uh, getting even further motion. And this is x rays at two months post op. 
So I go back to our original case, and this is what I did. Uh, you know, I guess um, here she is at one uh, one week post op, um, uh, and I had some concerns. I, and I, I shared this earlier with uh, Amy and John. Is I was a little worried that she was a bit too extended, and almost hyperextending a little bit. But it looked to me like we are maintaining the joint. There's a question here about the uh, the fracture fragment and its, and its articulation, whether there's step off, but I find that the articular congruency is more the key. Um, so what I opted to do was then um, reduce on some of the tension, take down some of the rubber bands so that it uh, could be released a little bit. Uh, and, um, and this is uh, at three weeks uh, post-op, um, an x-ray, but in the interval, she had a, a trauma that she sustained and uh, she fell while carrying her laundry onto her uh, left hand and one of her pins bent and she developed a little bit of slight radial deviation and minimal pain. Um, you know, I, I felt at this point that I needed to do something uh, to, uh, the x-fix was not doing its job anymore and, and I had to sort of release uh, or consider redoing the X-Fix depending on what I find. And what I do in these cases is I went to a, a fluoro machine and I took down the rubber bands. I evaluated her under fluoroscopy and thankfully she was noted to be fairly stable, tenuous a little bit in extension, but stable. I opted to then treat her with an extension block splint and uh, proceed with her rehab in that manner and I splinted her at 30 degrees and we worked on dialing her out slowly over a period of time. And this is her at uh, eight weeks post-op and you can see she's uh, she's still uh, obviously stiff a little bit but is maintaining um, a, uh, uh, a joint that's fairly congruent, still a touch of hyperextension but one thing I've learned to appreciate is she seems to hyperextend in other digits as well. And um, this is her um, again at eight weeks post-op. And finally at three months post-op, uh, she's uh, had even further improvement, which is encouraging and um, is maintaining her, um, her PIP joint. Uh, not perfect PIP joint, but uh, functional. Um, and um, and hopefully she'll go on to do well. And the Peter Stern studies have suggested that maintaining the congruency is more the key than, than um, any articular step off. One last comment before I, I, I dovetail to John. John, Amy, uh, Gary, any thoughts or questions or comments about that case? Uh, things I could have done. Um, you know, you want to pick the right patient, I think, as I reflect on, um, you want someone you can rely on, not to blame the patient about her being unreliable. She's really a great patient. But if you have someone that you don't think she came back routinely for her follows, which was really critical, and she did inform me when she had uh, Gary, any thoughts or questions or comments about that case? case before, uh, it, these things can go south and they can really be a problem, you know. So you want to pick the right patient for these particular. They're very demand. These are very uh, demanding for both a therapy perspective as well as um, as well as um, a patient need to be seen on a more regular basis perspective. And Amy will highlight in her case nicely some other nuances and pearls that uh, we can learn from that. I'll take one more minute to talk about one last thing: um, the difference between a pilon and the volar plate uh, uh, or dorsal fracture dislocation. This is a pilon where both the dorsal and volar cortexes are disrupted, and this is not a candidate for a force couple. Um, you have to use a dynamic traction device of some kind, whether it be the Suzuki or the Slade types, which are basically very similar, but uh, it's important to know that you can do a Suzuki for the type of uh, injury that I showed with the uh, AG with a dorsal dislocation. And, but for a pilon, you, you, uh, the AG will not be a, a good choice. And this is where I'll stop and um, I'll dovetail to you, John, okay? Okay, Mark, awesome. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, I think to, um, you know, your last case showed that 
that volar lip fracture does not have to be perfect, but the joint has to be concentric. So that was a nice example of that. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, these PIPs and how to fix them. I'm John Capo from New Jersey. Um, you know, we keep changing, but we're now we're, we're Rutgers, um, and there's four programs, but we're the best one. And um, uh, we're based in Jersey City and in um, in North Jersey. So, so the PIP joint is the key is is that is the, the concentric PIP joint reduction. That means it's got a, you know, it's got a. There's got to be no V sign dorsally. The volar lip fracture, it, you know, it's nice if it's perfect, but if it's a little crumbly there, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And we want stable range of motion. Sorry. So this is, you know, this is a chronic case that comes. And with this, you probably need, you know, a hamate. But treatment's difficult. There's no gold standard. There's no one way to fix these things. But it's a common fracture. And it's missed commonly, too. So that's a problem. Um, so, and this, uh, this is a nice, uh, this is a nice diagram that Peter Stern wrote years ago in the hand journal with, I think, Tom Kefauver. Yeah. You know, and how much is unstable? And it's, you know, they talked about 25%, 25 to 40 and greater than 40, which is kind of, you know, similar in all joints. But it's really if it's unstable because it's hard to see how big that fragment is. But if the residual joint goes dorsal, it's a problem. So we, sorry, we verified this. This is in our lab a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we took a PIP joint and we sequentially removed the volar structure. So the volar plate's a big piece of tissue, but it, it really doesn't give you stability. So if you take that out, it's stable. You take the accessory collateral ligaments, it's stable to dorsal subluxation. But we noticed that 25% of the volar lip taken it out, it gets some subtle instabilities, but at 35%, they're all unstable. So this is, you know, kind of looking at the the um, the uh, range of motion and the joint, con you know, concentricity. So that's what we think is, let me get rid of this. Huh? Um is the volar, uh, the volar lip, when it's more than 35%, it's a problem. So um, closed reduction, extension block splinting. There's different ways to do it. RAF, hinge X fix, vol volar plate arthroplasty. I will just touch that. I don't think it works very well. Um, so the splinting, we, you know, Marco talked about it. We've shown it, but you got to be careful. This is actually from a textbook, 30 degrees, but this is not good. You know, this there's a V sign here. It's not reduced. The volar lip piece, I don't care about that much, but it's not reduced. So you can't take this. This is another one, 90 degrees. And this is not right, right? There's that little V sign. It's got to be reduced and it's got to be concentric. And again, the volar piece can be splayed out, but the joint's got to be reduced. So I would just, I would just want to add the nice technique of extension block pinning, because if we need to put a splint on, I think it's very hard to hold them and, and look at the x-ray and see the x-ray. So this is a technique Peter Stern taught me. So if it reduces, and this is concentric, then I just put one pin in the head of P1, and it holds it. I'll go back. It holds it uh, from going dorsal. So and you can see how it moves in the OR. And you can you can flex them a little bit. They can't move that much because it's through the extensor tendon. But you get a little motion. And this is okay, right? This joint is reduced. The volar piece is off a little bit, but that's okay. And this patient will do well. All right, so now let's talk about RAF. That's my task mainly. So, you know, if we need to fix these, what do we do? And it's uh, oftentimes it's sequential. You know, we go in and we say, well, well, uh, you know, we'll try to reduce it. If we can reduce it, we'll we'll extension block pin it or splint it. And if not, then we have to do something. So this is a pretty obvious case, but it's nice to, to, to visualize how this is a chronic, well, it's five weeks out. This guy's a very tough guy. He's been working in the factory and he says he hurts it a little bit, but he's hinging He's hinging on that dorsal fragment, and he's got a big piece. So, so I booked him for ORIF versus hamate, and this is the shotgun approach, right? So, and I'll show some other slides. But you sequentially extend the joint, and this was his dors his volar fragment that I actually found, and it was a decent fragment, and it was kind of a you know it was the fragment it was kind of a hamate graft ready, um, but you have to take your time and get the you know, nerve vascular bundle out of the way to extend it and reduce it and he's concentric his joint he had a little wear on his joint so it looks like he's got a little step off but he looked good um and he's concentric and he did reasonably well and stayed concentric so if it's a big piece 
you can reduce it. And this piece was displaced. I found it if it's a bit and, and brought in, but if it's a big piece and it's attached to the volar plate and you can push on it, then you can leave the volar plate on it. But then you're looking at your fluoro because you can't see into the joint. So you usually have to take the volar plate off. So, so let's, let's go sequentially to, to worse ones. So this, this is a, a worse case. So this is a 37 year old guy that comes to my office and we have a lot of cricket leagues here, even though I'm in New Jersey and New York, but you know, they play club cricket and that's a real man sport because there's no gloves and the ball's very hard. They've shown me these guys, but so he comes to me three weeks out. So this is actually in the OR. Can I reduce him? So I'm trying to reduce him top right slide. He's not in the bottom. I'm pushing on it and it's not, it's not good, right? He's got a contracture. It's not reduced. So we have to do something. We can't pin it. We can't splint it. So we have to open it. This is just a CT scan that I didn't get, but it shows you the fracture is not a big fracture, but it's subluxated. So what do we do? So big approach. So a big flap, not a small bruner. And this is, you know, take your time. So, you know, that fragment is deep in here, right? Between the A2 and A4 pulleys, uh, take the sheath. And if you can keep that sheath, you can put it over as a flap. Here's your nerve vascular bundle. Keep that and make sure that subluxates dorsally when you bring it back. Here's the volar plate. So your fragment is distal. Uh, and again, if it's one big piece, you can just reduce it and look from the side. Or if you want to plate it, you can split the superficialis. But usually we have to release it from the fragment and tip it back and then start to do our shotgun, right? So sequential, do the shotgun. Then you're looking at this thing. It's kind of a like a tibial plateau, but you're looking right at it, but the pieces are small. So take your time, reduce it with wires, and then little screws. So usually it's 1013, sometimes 15 screws. So a reasonable reduction. And this is what you're looking at often is these small pieces with a central impression. But um, oftentimes you can reduce these. So a good reduction, I think it's reduced. I think he's concentric. And do you want anything? Do you, you do you want to add anything to this? As I extended him, he he slid a little dorsal. So I thought about it for you know three minutes, and I said, let's just put a pin in just to hold him. So I know he's going to stay. I left this pin in for three weeks, took it out in the office. So I know he's going to stay reduced, and he did well. He did reasonably well. He healed, and he's got a little. He's concentric. I like the joint reduction. He's got a little you know wear on his on the head of P1 maybe, but he is reduced and had a reasonable result. So I think these these small fragments, we still can fix these. So take your time. And if it doesn't, you can't fix it, you can just go on to the handmate. So I usually can send them for pinning, RAF, possible handmate, and even possible fusion in case the whole thing falls apart. So other fixation alternatives. So <clears throat> just to mention, this is a case report a few years ago from Singapore, uh, Winston Chu and his colleagues. So sometimes a plate works, right? So if it's real crumbly and you're looking at it, you can actually split the superficialis and put a plate as a buttress and get it to reduce. And again, those pieces aren't that as critical as the joint reduction. Uh, this is another case, another technique, you know, vo uh, a volar lip fracture with a central impaction. You can see it's impacted here centrally. Look at it, squeeze it together. And here's the central impaction. You got to bring that up and then wrap it uh, with a cerclage wire. Peter Weiss wrote an article on this years ago. So sometimes that helps with the small fragments. So this is a nice um, this is a nice diagram again from Peter Stern's article on this. So we know the volar lip fractures cause dorsal subluxation. The dorsal central slip injuries called cause volar subluxation. So you have to split these in extension and fix them dorsally. But then the pylons are a different animal, right? So it's volar dorsal. And you can't fix them just from a volar approach. So just to touch on this a little bit, um, pylon fractures are bad. This is, is an old article from Peter from Cincinnati, Peter Stern. And basically, he shows they all they, they do pretty bad. Even the traction, four out of seven, were pain-free. But they had uh, acceptable range of motion. So RAF didn't work well, but the traction seemed to work better, but not anatomic. So you need to have some kind of hinge. And Marco showed how he makes his... You know, that works very well. These are off the market. This is the old one from, uh, you know, a certain company. This one's off the market. Um, so know how to do this. This is this is uh, that uh, X fix. But the key is your axis pin. You got to get your axis pin right down the middle or the whole thing builds off of uh, wrong placement. So this is Tom Graham shared these slides with me, similar to what 
what Marco showed, but I think Amy's going to show something like this as well. So I just I'll show one case. This is a 30 year old, 35 year old lawyer fell in the gym and he's got a volar lip, but he's got he's been out for a while. It's it's about, I think, five weeks out. So I was worried about opening this up. And I when I reduced him, he actually reduced. So this is one of the frames that's available and they're all fiddly. You know, they're all fiddly. You got to put one on the radial molar side on the frame here. The good thing with this one is you can lock it if you want with two pins proximally and then take that pin out later. So it locks its aluminum. You can see, but it's hard to see, right? These That's the hard part in a lot of these. Is it reduced? So I spent a lot of time with the mini fluoro and the big fluoro, uh, but I think it's reduced. I think the dorsal piece is reduced. It looks like the volar lip fracture is not perfect, but the AP looks like it's lined up well. And you see this second pin will hold it. I removed it in the office and started to move. And again, you know, is it reduced? I'm hoping so. You know, there's only so many x-rays I can get. Um, and a mini fluoro is helpful to see, but it looks okay on the AP. We started to move him. He's the perfect patient for this. He doesn't complain. This guy was just, it's fine. I can deal with it. And he did pretty well. So this doesn't look perfect, but the joint's concentric. It's maybe splayed out. And maybe the P2 is a little dorsal, but concentric. You can see how this the axis pin pivots and he gets a lot of lysis there. Luckily, no infection. And he did very well. So sometimes these hinge X fixes or some type of, fr type of frame work. And that's all you want. You want it reduced. You want good motion. You want the finger straight. Uh, and it's a good result. So, all right. Lastly, we'll touch on the handmade. So if it's bad, we use this oh, this, this autograft, right? And Hill Hastings developed this when I was a fellow with him in Indy. We wrote it up. And it's the dorsal lip of the handmate lines up with the volar lip of P2. We looked at the the size and the handmate's much bigger. The contour works so you can take less of 50% of the handmate and you have enough. So this is one of the original cases. And the, this is the picture I showed originally. Where, and this is a huge win. This is one of Hill's cases. This guy comes nine months out and this is a fusion, right? But if you take your time, again, the big volar Bruner, uh, flexor sheath, um, retraction, there's the volar plate. It's a little blurry. They're old slides. Mm -hmm. Then you take your handmade graph. So fluoro, take your time, you know, center it on the central ridge. There's a bicondylar facet and take it as far wide as you can. Usually there's a little ridge on handmade on either side, but even if you crack into it, it's okay. It's still stable. Get a pin in it. That's the graft. It's a very nice graft. Take more than you need and then adjust it. So this is where it usually wants to go. And you look at that and the articular surface is okay because the hamate articular surface is thick, but the the angulation isn't good, right? You need to tip this thing up to give your volar buttress. So make sure you tip it with a volar buttress uh, restored and you usually have a gap here, but that's okay. And good overall alignment with the graft. It's really an amazing um, you know operation and Hills, uh, we thank Hill for that. And again, fashion the graph, make a nice defect when you put it in there and little screws. And it really is amazing how stable it is, you know, and the volar plate is back here. We'll reattach it, but you don't reattach it stoutly. It's, you know, it's um, it's that volar buttress that matters. And uh, people do very well with that. So so thank you uh, very much. Thanks, John. Awesome, man. Appreciate it. Oh, there was a question from one of the attendees about the circlage wire technique. Um, how do you minimize irritation from that? Uh, how do you sort of position it? Where do you, any pearls, size of the gauge, need, uh, size of the gauge band, uh, tension? Anything? Yeah, it's. It, I don't use it that often. It's tricky, but it's a small wire, maybe a 24 even. You know, it's hard to find those at times. But just a couple twists. And the one I showed, there was a bunch of twists. And, you know, I, I'll put it on the, the lateral side, the radial ulnar side, you know, and or even volar is OK, but you don't want it, you know, you know dorsal. Um, but sometimes it brings them all together and it is effective in combination. And uh, I think we have uh, 30 seconds for another, you know, I I'd, uh, I was at the AHS and um, and um, um Tom Hughes gave a nice little talk on the Hemi handmade, and there was this discussion about maybe harvesting the graft from distal to proximal so you can get a bigger wedge of cortical. Because the hard part is when you're trying to tap it out, 
you end up sacrificing that um, proximal part of your graft, which actually is the part that keys in to actually tilt the and 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 restore that angle like you were showing. And I thought that was a really clever pearl. So, you know, um, moving forward, I'm going to harvest the graft from that that angle to get a nicer, bigger piece of the actual body of the ha- of the hamate. So it keys in better with the uh, with the base of the metal phalanx. I don't know if you've had experience with that or not. No, I agree that that's the best way to do it. Get and you need a small curved osteotome, and take more than you need. You can always cut it down, and then proximally on the metaphysis, you can back cut it and take a little wedge out so you can get the an osteotome in from the other side as well. But yeah, I like to distract it and go from the joint um, proximal, distal to proximal and get uh, as big a piece as you can because you need that you know the joint piece is what's critical and the metaphysis is important for you know keying it in but you want it as big as you can and put a pin in there so you don't lose it and the first uh if this is your uh, first for the attendees if this is your first time doing these be patient with yourself take time it's a technically challenging procedure but once you get it down it, it'll it'll uh, be a great option for your patients um uh, next, I'm going to ask Gary to to speak. John, thanks again, buddy. Um, uh, Gary uh, is going to share some pearls. As you as you all are aware, these uh, injuries and, and a lot of things around the PIP joint are so therapy dependent. And um, Gary's kind enough to share some um, wisdom and um, and expertise related to how uh, we can approach these and maximize the outcome. Th- these patients spend so much more time with with folks like Gary than. Uh, than they do with us. And I appreciate your thoughts, Gary. Thank you so much. Yeah, I definitely want to run through, let me just move something on my screen out of the way. There we go. Um, I'm going to run through the types of dislocations and fracture dislocations and how they're managed. Let's begin tonight with dorsal dislocations, those dorsal fracture dislocations. I think the biggest thing to think about with the conservative management is that angle, as we were talking about before. And it's very tricky when you prescribe or send someone to therapy to fabricate an orthosis splint in a certain angle. You can see from the photo that the the swelling, the edema around the PIP joint can be very deceiving. So when you look, the splint is about 30, 35 degrees, but the joint angles may be 10 to 15. So again, that dorsal, it's good to measure laterally. That's helpful in prescribing an angle and then provide a little margin for error on the flexion side. So if it's stable at 20, make the splint at 25 to 30. Um, When there's some tenuous stability, we've had a couple where the patient just didn't want surgery. We have done a digital cast for a couple of weeks and then changed it to a dorsal block splint. So that's an option. And we've cast it actually, and then done it either right under fluoro or a fluoro or an x-ray immediately after. So usually with um, the PIP dorsal dislocations, when we can start moving, we allow flexion and then extension to the to the dorsal block. It's important when you can to start early motion because the PIP is not very forgiving and gets pretty stiff. And then we start bringing it out about 10 degrees per week from weeks four to six. PIP contractures are common. Once we restore full flexion, then I'll usually turn more of the attention to the extension side. Um, it's important that that joint is stable in a very in an increasing degree of extension, and then we have the option. I'll usually begin with relative motion because it's it's um, the easiest for patients to do in static, and then night splinting, and then potentially um, some sort of dynamic or serial serial casting for a residual flexion contracture. So here's a case, and this is very similar to what was talked about before. Um, received from an ortho, they went to a, a clinic and I think were treated in an alumifoam extension splint for three weeks and then referred to therapy to start moving. Some of the red flags we see if something's wrong is number one, they're very painful with extension. And that's not typical with these patients. Usually they're limited in their arc of motion, but there's not severe pain after three weeks. And then they they really had a hard time progressing. So after about a week, highly suggested they see a hand surgeon and here's the x-ray, you can see the fracture dislocation and that was treated by screw fixation. Once the RIF was done, then we began the comfortable range flexion with the extension block and progressed nicely. At about two weeks um, after he was progressing a little slow on the flexion side. So I like to add a relative motion orthosis that just changes the mechanics and helps guide some of that force from the MP to the PIP. 
This is about three and a half weeks. The flexion's improving, but you can see the extension's limited. That's when we start doing a night splint and a relative motion for extension. And then we we went both ways to get the end range flexion and then a dynamic PIP extension and achieve very, very close to full range on this one. Now let's talk about the volar fracture dislocation. So that dorsal, that central slip is disrupted. Those are the ones which have to be splinted in extension. So the PIP is extended, the DIP is free. I prefer to do these circumferentially, um, either a digital circumferential splint or um, even a cast, just with the DIP free so they can at least get some gliding. And a lot of times we'll see these post-op and this one joint was pinned and then the fracture fragment was pinned as well. When we're clear to begin motion, it's good to begin at about 30 degrees. And I like to use an alumafoam template because it's easy for the patients to use. <clears throat> They'll begin about 30 degrees of flexion as long as there's no extension lag. We'll, be, we'll increase that motion about 10 to 15 degrees per week. If two weeks they're progressing successfully, then we'll just go ahead and start to advance to unrestricted flexion. And again, we can use a relative motion or a blocking orthosis to alter those mechanics to address the stiff PIP joint. And then the lateral dislocations, a lot of times those are prescribed for a buddy strap, but you have to think that it's very hard for a small finger, especially if it's the ulnar collateral ligament of a small finger, there's nothing to buddy strap it to, or if an index finger radial collateral ligament. So I like these little hinge splints. <laughs> those do a nice job of stabilizing the joint and allowing early motion. If it's a complete disruption of the collateral ligament with the volar plate, we have to splint it in a little bit of flexion. And it's important also with these lateral dislocations and all dislocations to control edema, but we don't want to wrap and, and have more lateral stress on the joint. So I like to instruct people to do a Coban wrap this way, where you just sort of pinch and seal the top, and then you can trim it back and you get a nice little compression sleeve for the finger. Again, with these, the biggest challenge is avoiding lateral stress. Um, for the grade three, if there's complete lateral disruption in the volar plate, our timing of motion depends on the fracture fixation. It's important when we start moving these patients that we do things moving all the fingers together. That gives a little additional stability. And then again, watching how they're using their hand during ADLs because you want to avoid that lateral stress. At about six weeks, if there's residual deficits, that's a good time to start adding um, channel passive motion and again, static regressive and start to gradually increase your tension on the joint and increase your total end range time. I wanna talk a little bit about the external fixators. It's really important to encourage that early motion in, in the traction device. And that's not necessarily easy. You have to really work with your patients to gain acceptance and let them understand that it's okay and actually very important to start moving because a little bit mo even a little bit of motion early on is going to save a lot of problems for them in the long run. It's not e some patients are very accepting and they can get going right away, but some do have a hard time tolerating this device, at least from an aesthetics point of view. So here's an example of um a fracture with motion initiated in the dynamic traction frame. At about three weeks, it was taken out a little bit early because the physician was a little bit worried about the pin sites, but progressed extremely well. And about four and a half weeks, I added a relative motion, and this is five and a half weeks, and basically was able to discharge at that point. I have another gentleman now who the device was on for six weeks, and he started about two weeks ago, and we're about close to this point now. So if the patient participates early, and is okay moving, then they can do extremely well with these devices. So the keys to success, again, it's protecting the compromised structures. And as you were saying with educating the residents um, <clears throat> and primary care, you have to just decide if you just figure out what structures involved and splint towards that direction, you're gonna be safe. Um, you have to be careful with that dorsal block angle. It can be very deceiving. Early edema control is extremely important because the PIP joint's not forgiving. We want to do early motion as stability permits and then progress gradually and address residual stiffness as the joint stability permits. Thank you, Gary. That's wonderful. Um, I, I, uh, a couple of questions. One is um, I see you like the relative motion splint for PIP extension leg. Yeah. How do you discern that versus an LMB splint? Like a, yeah. um, 
Good question. Um, I always prefer active motion in my mind is always better than passive motion, especially to start with. That's our joint. That's our goal is to restore active motion. So I'll usually go to that first. And again, I'm not putting tension on the joint. So it's typically safer, right? I'm not putting an external force on the joint. The relative motion, I think, is really important because it's, the MP joint is usually not affected. So it's very loose. So you get force always goes to the loosest joint. So if somebody goes to make a fist what, with, with a stiff PIP, what you'll usually get is MP hyperflexion. And then the PIP sort of lags behind. So my either a blocking or relative motion, it just alters the mechanics and let, lets the patient both move and use and um, kind of fix the problem themselves. If it's not progressing, yeah, then I'll go to an LMB or something to, or supplement with that as well. Yeah, we have a question from one of the attendees. Um, thanks for sharing that. I, I like your thoughts about, you know, that active motion safer. And that's sort of how I sort of discerned it. Um, you know, once you get to passive motion, you invite a lot more force across that joint. And of course, across any repairs of any tendons or ligaments as well. Um, uh, where do you get the lateral spine and how do you apply it? That's a, that's a bit of a big question. So, um, the PIP hinge, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's commercially available, um, through performance health. It's, oh, and then it just has two Velcro straps. It's a lumifoam actually. So it just adjusts to the, um, proximal and middle phalanx size and then has two Velcro straps, which go around it. Great. That was a question from one of our attendees. Um, any other questions, Amy, John, you okay? Thoughts? Okay. Um, next, uh, uh, Amy's going to speak on um, a case. Uh, this is our last case, a uh, uh, case related to a complication. And um, um, we're hopeful that these cases will shed a lot of insight as to some of the nuances related to treatment. And uh, Amy has a wonderful case to share. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, Marco. Um, so I get to talk about complications, which there are many of with these type of injuries. Um, I'll present one case in particular. Uh, this is a 55-year-old female, very active in CrossFit. Um, she was doing these exercises where you jump up onto wooden boxes and then jump backwards off. Um, and during one of the jumps, she did not land in the center of the box, lost her balance and fell. Um, when trying to catch herself, her dominant hand struck the edge of this wooden box. Middle and ring fingers got caught um, and sustained hyperextension injuries. And then as the hand let go from the edge of the box, the small finger sustained a pretty forceful axial load as it struck the ground. So initial x-rays were revealing um, of three different injuries. So there's comminuted uh, intraarticular fractures at the base of the middle and ring P1. Um, and then there's a comminuted intraarticular fracture at the base of P2 of the small finger. So in deciding how to treat the small finger, um, I really analyzed the images closely um, and even got a CT scan to better understand the fracture fragments. Um, on the x-ray, it's suggested that that might be able to be fixed. Um, and that's really what I was, was looking at. The CT scan, however, um, did not uh, bode as well. So you can see um, on the CT scan images, it's a comminuted intraarticular fracture. Um, their central depression um, of the articular surface, and then both the volar and dorsal cortices of the base of P2 are involved. Okay, so in thinking how to treat it, I say to myself, can I fix this? Uh, the CT scan was worrisome, and I thought in my hands, fixing this would not go well. Next thought, can I hold this fracture in traction um, and see how it does? Um, maybe even let the patient move. That would be with a dynamic external fixator. Or are we giving up on this joint and talking about jumping to something more drastic like uh, an immediate arthroplasty or fusion? Um, I always want to attempt to save um, a native joint and the patient was in agreement. Um, and what we elected to do was proceed with a dynamic external fixator. Um, these are challenging, I think, to apply. Um, you're using small K-wires. 
Uh, you can't bend them too many times, right? So if you if you bend them once and decide that it's not in the perfect location, straightening out a small wire and rebending it puts you at risk of weakening the wire or even breaking it. Um, the placement through the center axis of rotation uh, in the distal P1 and distal P2 is critical to maintain uh, a concentric reduction. Um, and you don't get too many tries, right? It's not a femur where you're, you're putting a guide wire down for a nail and, and you can try three or four times. You really want it to be in the perfect center of rotation on the first pass. Um, so here is after placement of the wire um, at the distal aspect of P1 and um, getting ready to place it in the distal aspect of P2. And then bending the wires and applying traction. Um, in, in all cases, it's important, I think, to keep the wires pretty narrow, or meaning close to the, to the finger, so that it doesn't hit the neighboring fingers. Um, and in this case, with swelling that is expected in the neighboring fingers, I was even more cognizant of that. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to invite a pin site infection. So you don't want it to be so close to the skin that you can't keep dressings uh, in place um, to help prevent that. Okay, so um, on the lateral view below, I felt intraoperatively like I had a reasonable reduction of the joint. Uh, the post-operative plan was um, to initially rest the hand after fixation of three different fractures, uh, forearm-based ulnar gutter splint, including all three injured digits um, in the intrinsic uh, plus posture. Uh, we brought the patient back 10 days post-operatively, removed the splint and uh, discussed pin site care um, and got her right down the hallway to therapy to start motion. Uh, the hope was to leave these pins in sight for the pin um, from the dynamic x fix in place for four weeks, knowing that at any sign of infection, we'd have to remove them earlier. Um, and again, we warned her about pin site infections. And these are patients that I keep close to me and they come to clinic frequently for evaluation. So here's her x-rays 10 days post-op. Um, in looking at these x-rays, um, the traction applied from the dynamic X-fix is definitely visible. Um, and I, I wonder, is that too much traction? Is it um, appropriate traction? And one of the frustrations with these X-fixes is what do you do post-up day 10 if you don't like the traction? It's, it's hard, if not impossible, to change. Um, but the joint remains... Um, reduced, uh, no issues with pin sites, and she starts working with therapy. Um, three weeks postoperatively, this is kind of when the red flags started to appear um, and, and I started to be more concerned. She was very hesitant to move and very stiff and swollen, and not just in the small finger, but also in the middle and ring fingers. Um, a lot of what Gary said really resonated with me, uh, in particular about this patient, she did not like looking at metal coming out of her finger. You know, some patients um, think it's really cool and other patients just don't want to see it. And that's always an alarming sign when they don't want to look at their own hand. Um, at three weeks out, she was very stiff. Uh, she had a 10 degree arc of motion of the PIP joint actively from 20 to 30 degrees. Um, so not where I wanted her to be. Um, at four weeks post-op, again, you notice I'm keeping her close. I'm bringing her back on a weekly basis. Um, we're looking at the finger. We're talking about the need for therapy. Um, uh, but luckily, she did not develop any pin track infection. She was able to keep the dynamic external fixer in place as long as I had wanted. Um, we did a, a local uh, anesthesia and removed the X-fix in clinic. And then she walked right back down the hallway to OT. Um, to continue with her motion. 10 weeks postoperatively, she had only slightly improved in PIP joint motion. Um, so at that point, she had 30 to 60 degrees of active PIP joint flexion. Um, with therapy, she had a night splint to um, maintain extension and then also was working on um, aggressive, active, and active-assisted and passive uh, range of motion of the PIP joint. 
Due to her stiffness at that point, a dynamic PIP splint uh, was ordered for her. Um, and when that arrived, she started in that to help um, progress her range of motion. Um, at three and a half months post-op, still not doing great. Um, still stuck at 30 to 60 degrees and um, feeling frustrated. And when you're not moving, of course, the finger remains swollen. Um, we elected to try a gentle manipulation uh, under fluoroscopy in the office. Um, she was amenable to that. Um, I performed a digital block. And while watching her joint on the mini C-arm was able to gently uh, advance her range of motion. And that was helpful passively from 15 to 80 degrees um, is what she arrived at after the gentle manipulation. And again, we walked immediately down the hall right into the hands of her uh, therapist to um, try to keep the motion that we had gained. Six months post-op, um, she noted she was just burnt out from therapy. Um, she said the whole recovery from injuring three fingers was exhausting for her. Um, coming in multiple times a week was expensive. Um, it took her away from work. And she said she really was ready to see how the fingers did without it. She said overall, the hand was doing pretty good, but it could be quite achy at times. Um, and then she said it really doesn't limit her, doesn't get in her way much. So here she is one year post-op. Um, I asked her for some photos. She happened to be on vacation. Um, she told me um, that it was doing okay, didn't get in her way, and uh, wanted to tell me how great the beach um, was that she was at. So she seems pleased, at uh, least relatively speaking. So what is the complication in this case? It's post-traumatic arthritis, as well as notable stiffness. Um, you know, nothing ruins a great surgery like follow-up. You can like your intra-op x-rays, but one year later, her motion is certainly not where I want it to be. Um, as surgeons, we are always shooting for a home run, right? We always want those beautiful x-rays to show at conference. Um, and we don't always get it. Um, I also will note patients want to do great initially. Um, they're really into it. And as soon as it becomes, you know, persistent swelling, persistent pain, the third different brace that they've had to try, um, the, the cost of parking to come to therapy, right? They, they really um, adjust their own um, goals accordingly. And, and I think that's very understandable. Um, also, perception is reality. Um, as a hand surgeon, that's not a composite fist at all, right? I'm looking at MP stiffness, maybe from her fixation of P1 at that location. Um, and as noted in the earlier photo, she's lacking a lot of PIP extension now that we've gained flexion. Um, but the patient in her caption, when she sent the, the photo back on her, um, on our EMR was, look, I can make a full fist. Um, and again, how beautiful the beach is. Um, so I suppose there's joy in the, in the sense that um, my patient is happy. Um, these are really, really tough cases with no cookbook um, and a lot of intraoperative creativity um, and modification of maybe your plan A, B, or C. Um, but analyzing these cases, um, you learn a lot, um, which is super helpful. Amy, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, you know, that leads into some of the questions that I've been farming uh, through our uh, question and answer box. Um, can you uh, give your pearls on what you do about the mechanisms of how to bend the wire and apply to some of the technical details? And I'm happy to share as well. And John, you're welcome to as well. Yeah, you know, there's certain cases in an, in an academic setting, especially there's parts of a case that you're happy to have other people do. And then there's parts of a case where you have a lot of ownership over. And I will say that getting that K wire in the center axis on the first shot is hard. And that's not one that I will let go wrong, uh, you know, frequently um, because you don't want that. You don't want to have that K wire loosen um, and get a pin track infection or you don't wanna be unable to maintain that center rotation. So I will say that I, that's one of those, you know, there's slow moments operating and fast moments operating. That's a really slow intentional moment with really good C-arm views. Um, 
I will, I kind mm-hmm. of alluded to it, but you, you don't get any redos with bending very small K wires. Um, and if you bend it more than one or two times, they often break or worse, they don't break in the OR, but then they could break for the patient. Um, so I'm very intentional and slow with where are you going to bend the wire? Um, I use the Fraser tip suction uh, tip to um, over a heavy needle driver to slowly and intentionally bend um, the wires. Um, and I'll usually have a photo, just like we'll have x-rays up in the OR, I'll have a photo of a perfect X-fix that we've put on on the computer screen and, and we'll stare at it while we're, while we're contouring the, the current X-fix. Absolutely. I, and those are wonderful pearls, uh, you know, and I'll let John chime in, but one of the things I've learned and I have a needle driver here is if you, you know, especially when you have a digit, like that's a middle finger digit, you know, you, you can't go too broad. Otherwise the other fingers will suffer from irritation and pain and also stiffness because they're not moving so well that everything's in the way and bringing that pushing down real good and trying to get as close to the skin. Now, if you get it too close, I've had that class before where, where now the skin is swelling and it's sort of pushing up against the pin and it's sort of futzy and it's like a source of irritation potentially as well. It seems that walking that line is so critical and, um, and you're right. If you, <laughs> your mistakes that happen during that part of the process and that surgery will, will come back to remind you weekly and to be frank, I think in part that case I showed where the where the patient had, I, I'm as much to blame as anyone for her having that trauma because I think it made it hard for her to do her ADLs and things that she needed to do because she was it was too futzy. It was not quite as streamlined as it could be. Um, John, any pearls on your end about bending the pins and how you sequence it and things like that? Yeah, I, I think for non-border digits, it's really difficult um, and it's tolerated less well. <clears throat> one trick if I'm working on, you know, uh, one finger, especially the middle finger, ring finger, is I'll co-band the rest of the hand and get it out of the way. So I'm just dealing with one finger. That helps. Um, you want to bend the wires, uh, you know, one shot. You know, it's a nice, there's some tools that have a three-point bender you know, from some of the distal radius sets that use, um, you know, K wires that helps. Um, but yeah, you want to get, you want to get your, your needle driver on it with a Fraser tip, but that three point bender works pretty well. And as Kim said, um, or I'm sorry, as Amy said, uh, that, that wire in the center, you got to get it right, you know, and if you miss it, it, it's, it'll fall into that hole. So, you know, I'll let my train, you know, it depends on the trainee, but yeah, you got like kind of one shot at that. You want to get that right. Thanks, John. Um, a couple other thoughts, Gary, did you want to add some? Yeah, I was just going to say um, for post-op, you know, again, trying to move and, and having trouble with ADLs with the fix that are sticking out. I have had some success just wrapping some light cotton cast padding around there. Um, if you wrap it around, it just buffers it a little, and then you can put a stock in it over that. And it just, it lets them move and everything, but it hides the visual a little bit. And it also a little softer gets the border digits and it tends not to poke into other things or get caught. I like that. I like that. I, I tend to wrap, this leads into my next question about, um, you know, we've talked about pin tract infections and certainly it's obviously a concern that I actually wrap zero form around my pin sites, just a single layer to minimize infection. But uh, Amy, John, um, Gary, what, what are your thoughts about how to minimize pin tract infections in these cases? Because they're on, obviously, for weeks, and and uh, and uh, we're vulnerable. Yeah, it's hard, um, and I think once you get past three weeks, you're at a really good risk of an infection. And so, I want people to watch closely. I think what happens, what works best in my hands is early on to have either bacitracin adaptic or xeriform flush to the skin. And I I look at it like I'm sealing in the sterility of the operating room for the first, you know, five to 10 days. Once they're changing dressings frequently, then my mindset switches to, I want warm soapy water running over it every day. And I'd rather a little bleeding at the junction of the skin and the pin, because now we've lost sterility. Um, And that's when I want them feeling comfortable washing warm soapy water, 
hair dryer on a cool setting to dry the skin um, and and let it be. But that's how I look at it. Sterile initially. And then once it's out in the world, I want them washing it frequently. And uh, I will add a couple things. Uh, if we don't do it technically right, we're going to invite more motion. And, you know, I've seen these x-rays after I'm done where there's a sort of a big hole on the, in the bone. That's on us because we really didn't get the center right. And those invite pin tract infections as well. Because if it's not a, a tight design, uh, it can invite more motion at the pin and problem. And I am... I'll be, I hope no one in infectious disease is listening to our webinar, but I am very liberal about antibiotics. <laughs> After that three week period, I'm like, put it in the water, just let them have the antibiotics for prophylaxis. And I, I know that it's not always responsible from an ID perspective, <laughs> but I'd rather just try to get them through across the finish line uh, bef before having being forced to take the x fix off. Um, so uh, those are some thoughts, John. <clears throat> I agree, Marco. I mean, I, I give him Keflex or whatever, you know, if I have any doubt, because I'd rather quell it. And then if you can get another, you know, 10 days or two weeks out of the pin, that might be enough to, you know, finish finish the, the treatment. But um, yeah, I'll give him antibiotics at the drop of a hat. I still use peroxide cleaning if there's any, you know, drainage from it and zero form dressing on it and wrap it up. But yeah, you want him to move. You want him to get it out there. Uh, Gary, uh, another question, a uh, really good question from someone in the audience. Um, does mirror therapy help that fear, uh, the phobia that people have with the fixator? Does that, is that helpful? It certainly can. Um, it just sort of, if they're having trouble it, just getting the coordination of movement, I think it can be helpful just to visualize. It's not a long, you know, it, it, three to six weeks. So yeah, that that can certainly be an intervention which can be helpful because they're seeing, at least they're cortically seeing their hand move more normally as they're trying to move along with it. Gotcha. Um, thanks, thanks to our faculty that are here too. Uh, uh, Emil uh, Dianosian, uh, he... Um, he had a nice question, and this one might pertain to you, Amy. You did a, uh, when you make your x fix you can do them obviously with rubber bands or just with the, with the wire serving as the traction. Um, pearls on how you do it, I mean, with rubber bands, you, you might have the ability to, to lighten or increase traction depending on how, um, how many you use or how, how often you wrap them over themselves. What are your pearls about uh, creating traction with the wire X-Fix? Uh, how futzy is it and how easy is it? And uh, why do you lean that way versus a rubber band type design? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I've always used K-wires only. And so that's a very simple answer for why I keep it that way, because it has worked well in my hands. Um, rubber bands worry me maybe unnecessarily for a patient's ability to break them, rip them, take them off themselves. Um, I, and when I'm thinking back of my patients with these injuries, a number of them would worry me to send them home with something that was too modifiable. Um, but it's largely just because that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, where to bend the wires is, I don't know if I'd say futzy, it's intentional and slow. And what I'll do is have a lateral x-ray with traction that I want to achieve and realize that that's where the, the curve that's going to receive the wire needs to be. Um, and so I'll mark the wires that are have from proximally that have been bent at 90 degrees and are now tr um, traveling distally in line with the digit. I will mark where the distal pin needs to intersect those wires. And then you reverse engineer your bend because you need two bends um, in order to create a little hook for the distal wire to sit in. So it's slow, it's intentional, um, and it's another step again where you can't unbend it and rebend it. Um, so I wouldn't say it's fuzzy, it's just slow and intentional. Perfect, thanks Amy. John, um, we only we may have time for a couple more questions, but one question: Do you talk about hemi hame with every case, or when do you engage in the discussion about 
hey, I need to talk to this patient about the possibility of plan B being the hemi hemate or, or, you know, what, what's your threshold of the dialogue? How do you counsel your patients? Yeah, if, if there's a chance, <clears throat> and it's, you know, sometimes hard to tell, but if they're, if I'm thinking, you know, we might need to go to the hammock, you tell them. And, and you always err at, you know, telling them and, and consenting them for it, because if, you know, heaven forbid, you got to do it, you got the consent. So it's, it's most of the time, Marco, if I think I'm going to have to open it, because you never know what's going to happen if it falls apart. You know, if it's a little volar lip and I think I'm going to just reduce it and put an extension block pin. But, you know, maybe I wouldn't. But the safest thing is to consent them for everything. You know, and say, look, I don't think this is going to happen. But, you know, in case we need to take a little piece of butter. And then when you talk to them about it, some people might say no way. So then, you know, well, you know, we and then we, you know, we have to do something else. But I consent them most of the time because you never know what's going to happen. Um, what do you, um, <clears throat> when you, um, when you shotgun a joint, how do you, I mean, I've had a couple cases of neuropraxia related to shotgunning. How do you, how do I prevent that from happening? Or is it just, yes. a, just a part of the game, part of the process that there's a risk what? of that? I think you have to take your time, you know, it's, you know, it looks easy, but it, you know, it, you got to make sure your neurovascular bundles are, are, you know, are free and released and you really have to take your time because in the first time you do it, it's a little scary. You know, you go, what, what the heck happened here? But um, especially if it's a chronic case, make sure the neurovascular bundles are released and they're, and they're going around the corner. And then you have to release your, your collaterals and release the collaterals completely on either side. Cause that's going to tighten it up and then go slow. You know, it's kind of like, you know, what what Amy was saying. It's, you know, it's slow and intentional here. You take your time, take your time, and then and then it goes, right? So, but make sure your nerves are out of the way, nerves and artery. Mm -hmm. I would add to the, um, be ready for a blanched digit at the end, right? Especially as, as patient age goes up, or if they have any little hint of Raynaud's that maybe you didn't know about, um, if you've done a, a, a big digital block after a, um, a shotgun approach, when you first reduce that joint you let, and you finish, you let the tourniquet down, um, it often takes a minute or two for perfusion to return. And, yeah. and it almost does, but be ready for that and also be ready to put some warm saline on it and, and walk away for five minutes and come back because it's probably going to be okay. Or even papaverin, I've had that class before, you know, so especially like you said, Amy, the older, the older folks, you know, you have to be careful. We talked a little bit about post-traumatic arthritis and older, when these injuries occur in patients over 50, it's a little bit of an orange compared to an apple. Their, 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 their tissues are much less uh, forgiving. They, uh, they already have some degree of chondromalacia or arthritis that's settled in. They're not likely to get as much motion. They're more vulnerable to complications. They're more vulnerable to uh, some of the soft tissue crimes, especially when it comes to shotgunning. And um, I've learned to have discussions with patients about that preoperatively, say this is a potentially serious endeavor. So, um, but uh, with good technique like John described and uh, good counseling and patience, <laughs> it can be, uh, it can be uh, usually uh, okay for us. Um, yeah, if, so, if somebody's older, Marco, and, and you feel their arteries are calcified, <laughs> be really careful and maybe avoid the shotgun. And if it's a big piece, right, and it's you're just going to push it down and you can leave it on the volar plate, which is rare, but sometimes you don't have to shotgun it. So you push it down, leave the vol volar plate on it, and you can K-wire it or put a little plate on it. Um, so you always don't have to shotgun it. I hear you, bud. Um one question about the graft uh, from one of the attendees, John. Uh, graft is usually big from the hemi hamate. Any tips on cutting them to size or a little bigger is better? Is it bigger to have a bigger graft or trim it down? To, how do you discern those nuances? The key, the key is, you know, is that the articular surface is is appropriately sized, and then oftentimes that metaphysis is is sticking out. Um, but you want it to be, you want, you want a little bit bigger, a little 
but bigger is better because if it's small and it subluxates, then the game's over. Um, but articular surface should be like the, the picture I showed. It should be similar, you know, to the to the native. And if it's about half, it's similar to the, the dorsal lip. Um, and oftentimes your metaphysis is tipped up. So I'll I'll fix it and then you can burr it down a little bit proximally if you want to. And I've done sort of the opposite sometimes. And sometimes when I box myself into a corner where it's too small, I'll just take some structural graft, an allograft, or just buttress it behind. It's okay to interpose something there to reconstruct that angle and that that that, that depth. So it's not the end of the world if you overdo it in terms of trimming it down too far. Obviously, you want to get it right, in my opinion, and um, certainly get it right the first time, but there are salvage techniques. If you do enough of these that you sort of work your way around where you can sort of maintain, like you said, the key is to get that volar lip right, get the angle right and, um, and uh, get it to heal, which most of these heal. I haven't seen knock on wood on the next one I do. Uh, it's going to be a non-union, but I haven't seen a lot of non-unions with, uh, with this, thank goodness in my experience. No, and they don't resorb, you know, we've looked at them 15 years out. And these things, you know, it's amazing. The cartilage, you know, if it heals, which I haven't had a non-union either. I don't think they don't heal. They they last, you know. And, you know, just to comment, you saw that when I tipped that one up, there was a little defect behind it, like you said, Marco. So I'll just stick some graph behind there because that doesn't matter. The joint matters. I think we're one minute over. Um, I can't thank you all enough for, for – I can't thank, first of all, the attendees, the faculty – Amy, Gary, John, I can't thank you enough for being here and sharing your wisdom and expertise. I learned a ton and I can't, uh, this is awesome. Um, I appreciate the faculty that were uh, in the chat box, uh, uh, Emil, and um, I saw Jeff earlier, if he was on, still on. I uh, appreciate the AO faculty, the AO staff. Uh, thanks, Mackenzie. Thanks, Jenny. Um, thanks, Beth. Um, thanks, um, um, I'm missing someone. Uh, he's not on, I don't think. Thank you, Paul, as well, and Kim for being here, and uh, and um, um, Ron. I forgot to mention Ron. I don't know if he's on or not, but uh, I uh, hope everyone enjoyed this, uh, and I uh, look forward to the future sessions, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening, and uh, thanks again for uh, being a part of this. Marco, thank you. It was a great thanks. session. Thanks, Thank you guys. A lot of fun. See ya. Hi, everybody. Good night. Good night.